Um, hi, I'm Azelle, obviously from the upcoming. Lovely to meet you both, and congratulations on a fantastic film, oh, The Elephant you. Queen. So if we could start by perhaps saying how you got involved in this project together, and uh, what led you to tell the story of these magnificent creatures? I think what, what drew us to this, this story was that we'd been filming in Africa for, for 30 years, always making wildlife films, but we'd never made a film about elephants. But in that time, we've seen how elephants interact with small creatures like dung beetles and chameleons and things. And then we were filming in Amboseli National Park in 2009, 2010, when there was a terrible drought. And what we saw was how the elephant matriarchs, you know, these, the female leaders of the families, were just so caring and empathetic when it came, came to their families. You know, how they cared for the, you know, when, in the most terrible times when, when babies were dying and that, but how they essentially held the whole family together. And so we thought we want to tell, you know, a, 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 a story centered on, a, on one of those amazing matriarchs, but also to, to then show all the sort of smaller animals that are part of the ecosystem and which are so tied to the elephants in, in some way. And how long did the filming process take from start to finish and where exactly was it again that you shot and at what radius roughly did this, this cover? Um, so we were, it took us four years of living in the wild in Savo East National Park in Kenya. We were with a tiny team, Mark did all the cinematography and um, while he was filming I would be editing um, and um, it really, it, it was <laughs> Sorry, can you ask that question again? <laughs> and so, how long did the filming process take from start yeah. to finish? Where exactly did you shoot, and and how and what sort of radius roughly did this cover the area? So the film took us four years of living in the wild in Kenya with a tiny team um, to make, and we were in Savo East National Park, which is in southern Kenya. And Savo is, is a vast area. Um, it's the size of Massachusetts. It's something like 14,000 square kilometres. And we were trying to follow one family in that park. And there's a lot of the area which you can't, you can't actually move around in because it's, you know, it's either volcanic it's lava bush. or it's, it's escarpment or it's thick bush. Um, so it's very much us trying as, as best we could to follow the, the story of, of one family. And were Athena and her herd aware of your presence while you were filming? And did you get quite close to her? Did you feel you built up any kind of trust within that herd? Um, I think we, we did build, build up trust. Um, and what happened was, you know, we found Athena after a year and a half of, of searching. And we found a, you know, we came into camp one day and she was standing um, in the shade of a tree behind the kitchen tent. And when she sort of turned around and we saw those amazing tusks and we saw the makeup of her family, which was small with you know with tiny calves and that we thought great you know we've really found our family now um and then it was about trying to i mean yes elephants do do know you're there and what would happen was we would go out every day in a vehicle with a camera on the side a four by four and we would follow them and we'd try not to get too close but if we ever did get too close then if the, if the elephants looked up and they acknowledged our presence in some way then we'd back off and then over the weeks, we get slowly closer and closer and closer. And we cut that distance down from about 70 yards to 30 or 40. And then the one time when we knew we'd gained their trust was when um, I was filming at the base of a small hill and Athena left her calf princess and walked, it seemed quite deliberately, around, around the front of the vehicle to the other side. And I thought, Greg, at that stage, you know, two things can happen. Either it's a test, <laughs> in which case I, I, can't, I can't move the vehicle, I've just got to sit there, or she's made a mistake. And, you know, in that case, you're then between an elephant female and a calf, which is not a good place to be. So I just went, I just froze. And after a minute or two, Athena rumbled and Princess looked up, saw her mum was the other side, and sort of went very slowly around the front of the car. But from that day on, we had the most amazing access. It was like, this was a test and we'd passed it. Oh, which isn't mm. always the case, obviously, no. because as we know, there's no doubt the image of the elephants and poachers go hand in hand. Mm. Mm. Was it something you yourselves encountered while you were, while you were filming, any sort of threat of violence to you guys? Or? Yeah, we, we certainly saw the rise in poaching as, as the price of ivory went up, so did the poaching. And in the end, in one area, we were actually started outside the National Park, and in that area, we found we were actually sharing waterholes with poachers. 
So, and we, we got, got to a stage where actually rangers would be, injured rangers were being brought into camp. We, um, our assistant director, um, Etienne, flew on several occasions rangers out, had them dying in the plane. It was, we were right in the middle of it. And because we were helping, we were then pro probably vulnerable to becoming, you know, a target. A target. Mm. So we we decided after a while we couldn't work with the elephants. They were just too nervous, and it it, it was hopeless. So we actually that was when we decided we needed to move mm. it w into a national park into Sabah East. Mm. And the amazing thing about elephants is they know where they feel safe. Safe. So we were seeing the same elephants, um, you know, forty miles away. But once they were inside a national park. Um, then their whole demeanour completely changed and they would be relaxed, you know, they'd be out in the day where we'd been previously, they'd only come into the waterholes at night and so, you know, we, it was impossible to film. But suddenly their behaviour changed, they were relaxed and we could get close to them and from that day on that, that really drove the film and, it, mm. and the story. Then. And obviously you did all the cinematography mm. and what were some of the tricks that you used to kind of get, you got some really lovely low down shots <laughs> and obviously you've yeah. got some fantastic footage of really extreme weather conditions. Yeah. So what are the tricks that you guys did? Um, I mean all sorts of things. Um, it was amazing with that weather, with the extreme, really extreme mm. weather, that happened what, once in four years? Yeah, it, it, it was so, so rare. And yeah. what we do is, I mean... Every time we thought it was coming, we'd dash out. Yeah. But you know, often it didn't build up enough, did it? And we'd had the plane, the plane rigged essentially, ready for oh, the, okay. to take the camera. Um, and so we, you know, when we saw a storm coming, we'd race for the airstrip, get the camera on, and get up as soon as possible. Well, and I, I had one time when I was um, up with the camera assistant Pete Kalis, and we'd been waiting for this dust storm, and we saw it coming. We got to the airstrip just before it hit the strip, got up in the air. And then, you know, then it was great because we could see this huge storm rolling and it picked up the, um, the, the dust and it went up sort of hundreds and hundreds of meters in the air. And we were flying around looking you know, filming and it was great. And then we looked around for the airstrip. We were starting to run low on fuel and actually we couldn't see the airstrip because it was just, <laughs> it was just dust all over the, underneath us. Um, and at that stage, we did one of two things. We couldn't go to that airstrip. We didn't have, we didn't have enough, enough uh, fuel left in a plane to get to any other airstrip. So it's like, okay, we know there's a dry lake bed there. We'll go we'll head for a dry lake bed. And you know, if the worst comes to the worst, we'll just cut the engine and glide down and see if we can go down through the dust and land on the lake bed. And then just as we were doing that, just as I was setting course for this lake bed, we looked down again and luckily the, um, the storm had cleared the strip and we landed on, on fumes. But we got we got the shot, and that was what was important. And then at the opposite end of the scale, when we want to get down and film at <clears throat> elephant toenail heights, we built um, a metal box just about the size that would take Mark and a camera and a tripod, and buried it underground so that like there was a letterbox slit for the camera to, for the lens to go out of. But that was then at water level or at ground level, so that we could get that angle. We wanted to we wanted the little guys we wanted to be down on their level when we were telling their part of the story. Um, but anyway, we would put Mark in it, close the metal lid, literally, and for 12 hours he would stay in there and roast. roasting. Yeah. Aren't you kind? <laughs> so we no, used was, all sorts was, of different techniques to... But that was, that was, that was the worst, I think, of yeah. everything. Because so you're, you're in there and you're just, it's so hot. The, you know, the, you've got a metal lid above you in full sun that's just beating down on your head. And the worst thing, well, my, my one fear in that box was that every morning we opened it and we'd find that frogs and toads had, had leapt through the thing and they were sitting in water, a little, um, a little pool of water in the bottom of the box. And I, I know that cobras love frogs and toads. I just, my, my one fear was that I'd be in there, wide awake as normal, <laughs> and, and a cobra would come into the box because they, they love to hunt in, in sort of dark areas. And I just thought, you know, the, the prospect of having a cobra in a box with me without either it or me being able to get out. I just thought, you know, that was the one thing <laughs> that kept me awake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fully petrified. Okay, and my final question is, what do you hope that viewers um, will take away from this film? We hope that people will fall in love with elephants, so that, the, that what is an emotional story will move them to, move people to love them, care for them, and want to share the planet with them. Because if we don't all do something, we will not be sharing the planet with elephants. We will wipe them out. Well, it's a very emotive tale that you've managed to get through in your film, and it was, it's wonderful to see. So thank you very much for speaking thank to you. me. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.